All right. So let's get into the 15 lessons because honestly, it is a lot of ground to cover. I was a little bit overwhelmed. I, you know, I made this big promise and I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to squeeze this into an hour? Well, we're going to try. And then I'm going to talk faster than my usual Kentucky slow dialect. So bear with me. Um, the first lesson is that bigger is not necessarily better. Better is better. And so many of us get caught up in bigger numbers. And I was one of those people for sure. It's like, what is the top line revenue? How many clients can I have? We see that in social media constantly. How many likes, how many followers, all that stuff. They're easy to count. They're easy to show off. But vanity metrics are not the result. Like, I want to know now, profit, days off, you know, clients that I enjoy working with, not necessarily those big vanity metrics. And as soon as I disassociated myself from these vanity metrics and really stopped caring about these top line numbers, um, my personal income significantly increased. And my quality of life, my my hours worked decreased, my quality of life got better, my stress dramatically diminished, and lots more vacations ensued. So don't necessarily assume that bigger is the path to happiness, right? Um, so from, from my perspective, I would tell you, focus on getting the outcome that you want. Don't tie it to some sort of giant top line number. And man, you're, you're going to be happier. You're probably going to generate more profit along the way. And you're going to build what I call your ideal business. Um, lesson two, man, the, the way we've always done it, if you've ever heard that before from anybody, it's the path to mediocrity. And we see it all the time. I, I worked in higher education, um, you know, at a state university for a while. And there was a lot of this is the way that we've always done it. Now, fortunately, that university has got different leadership now. And they're more progressive. But for a long time, that's, you know, that that's the path to you just kind of being stuck in the middle. Right. Because you're not the first mover. You're not originating anything. You're not innovative. Well, all of the su successes that I've had, the things that I personally would consider big successes come from stepping away from the norm. The way I ran my college baseball program, it allowed us to go to the World Series, even though we had one of the smallest budgets in the country, was a very different approach than what would be the norm. The way that I built my first training business, the way we built our franchises, all that stuff deviated from the norm. I even had, when I got into the fitness industry, you, you mean, you may think like subscriptions are common now, right? Everybody does that. I had the two leading consultants in the fitness industry tell me I was crazy because we were selling subscription-based stuff and people were buying on 12-month contracts. And they're like, well, that will never work. We sell packages. And now the entire industry does it. But in 2004, there weren't really anybody doing it. So be willing to deviate from the norm. Um, the, the next one that, that I really gravitate to is this idea of connection over retention. And what I mean by connection is a relationship has two parts, right? or connection has two parts, relationships and results. And we focus a lot in the industry over this idea that unbroken memberships are the path to success. But if you keep a relationship with somebody and they believe that you're delivering them results that make them happy, move them towards their goals, man, I'd rather have somebody stick around for six, seven, eight years out of 10 or 12 than to have two years of unbroken membership. Right. Like people's lives get busy. They get, you know, if they have kids, the seasonality of things really can be, you know, dramatically different between the school year and the summer. Um, people have changes professionally. People have changes personally. If they need to take a break and we actually have a relationship with them, it's a break. I mean, think about the, the close friends that you have. You know, if, if you're like me. Um, some of my close friends, they don't live anywhere near me. 
So the proximity probably diminishes the amount of time we see one another. The the different things we have going on in our lives, the scheduling, you know, around having kids or people's job stuff or whatever else, it it doesn't change the quality of the friendship. It just may change the, the frequency, right? And I think if you build strong relationships with the clients, you get some of that carryover. You get the fact that, hey, if I'm doing this stuff, I'm doing it with you. It's just right now I need to take a break from doing it. And I think as an industry, we just don't think about that way. Think about lifetime value over unbroken memberships. Think about showing up for somebody and them knowing that you care about them. Because if they know you care about them, when they are able to participate, they're going to participate with you. All right. So that's three. Lesson number four. This is here. I'll give you a disclaimer. I am not a financial planner. I am not a certified financial planner or some sort of financial advisor, anything like that. I'm not an accountant. I don't want to be any of those things, but I can tell you this. The easiest way to build wealth is to increase your personal income. It is not to try to game the system. It is not, you know, the ups and downs of everything, the stock market, crypto, real estate, all that stuff. It's always easier to weather the storm if you've got cash, if you can increase your personal income, right? Because then, you know, you can play the long game. You can ride those waves. It's okay if you ha- if you make errors. It gives you more margin for error. It allows you to diversify your investments. Um, having a longer time horizon because your cash flow is good in the moment is so, so powerful. It's just such a stress reducer. And as somebody who grew up in a house where money caused a lot of stress between my my now divorced but then married parents, um, we want to eliminate money stress any way we can. And like I said, the easiest way to do this, to make better decisions, to have a sense of control is to increase your personal income. So don't always think, oh, I'm just going to increase the top line revenue. I'm going to keep pouring money back into the business hand over fist. You need to pay you. And if you pay you, you're going to have more peace of mind. You're going to have a better quality of life. And frankly, if you're the business owner, you're the most valuable employee. You need to give yourself a raise whenever you can. All right. Lesson five, you get what you celebrate. And man, this came to me probably later in life than I wish it would have. Um, I remember distinctly my time as a college baseball coach. I've been involved in some stuff with that baseball program as of late as they hire a new baseball coach. And I'm involved in that process. And it brings back plenty of memories. One of which was I did not enjoy winning at all. It was like a relief. I like losing was excruciating. Winning was a relief. And I probably enjoyed like two games ever winning as a coach. And it's a mistake. If you pour yourself into things, you need to enjoy them, right? Celebrate the wins. It improves the culture because people like being happy. And it reinforces the stuff that we want more of. It heightens the focus. It keeps people motivated. Um, and people talk about the, the process or the destination and like, oh, stick to the process, stick to the process. Well, then make the process more enjoyable. You want people to stay stay with the process, make it more fun to be in the process. Celebration isn't an event. It's a habit. And if you think that way, if you embrace that, you're going to be so, so much better off. All right. Lesson number six. Hey, Jamie, I'm cruising through these. I'm doing great. Um, see that little celebration for me. Um Lesson number six, develop non-traditional assets for leverage. See, I talked about finance stuff uh, a couple of moments ago. And, you know, the, yes, we think of assets like our house is an asset or something like that. Well, non-traditional assets, what I mean by this is when you create things that have utility, right? Like if you create things that you can use in multiple ways, that you can recycle, that maybe you can even sell. Man, they they don't show up on a balance sheet all the time, right? But they save time, they allow for scale, 
And like I said, you can package them up and sell them. That's how I got into the fitness industry, this side of it. I just packaged up what we were doing at our gym and sold it. And it worked for us. And I think it gave other people a little bit of either a head start or um, threw some gas on the fire so they could go faster. So what's a non-traditional asset? Well, emails, podcasts, books, sales pages, scripts, ads, systems. Everybody talks about systems. Really a system is just documenting what's working so that other people can do it too or so you can do it more consistently. Your experiences, your stories, document those. Social proof, document that. All of those things are assets. Think about it. You can recycle before and afters over and over and over. You can send the same email multiple times. It can be used in other areas. It can be a script for a video. It can be a post on social media. So create these assets. And really, you could probably create one year's worth of stuff. When we think about content that we're posting or sharing or whatever else, you could probably create one year's worth of stuff. And with subtle updates and just kind of a refresh, not have to create much more for the entire time you're in business for a lot of the content that people do. All right. So that is lesson number six. I'm going to flip over. Lesson number seven, this has been um, as important as any of these for me. Build on the things you're confident and competent in. I think that some people have this false sense of comp- confidence. They're, they're like, hey, I'm good at this thing over here, so I'm probably good at everything. And that's rarely the case. But There are things that you can be good at that you can go one degree away from and do more of, right? Like if you're a good public speaker in person, you'd probably be a good guest on podcasts, right? If you are somebody who is good at writing emails, then maybe you'd be good at writing articles. Maybe you should consider writing a book, but, you know, leverage the things that you're confident and competent in and do more of it. You're going to be able to move faster. You're going to have a higher probability of success, and it's going to be a lot more fun. That doesn't mean we have to completely ignore our weaknesses. I mean, we've got to figure out how to navigate them. If they are things that are key to a business's success, somebody has to do them. But if you are great as a leader, then maybe your job with those is hiring the right person to lead. So they can manage those those areas. But build on the things that you're confident and competent in. I have made um, a career out of being good at about five things. And it, it has allowed me to kind of be in all parts of the fitness industry. It's allowed me to um, serve lots and lots of people, build different types of businesses, because I've stuck to my strengths. And I would encourage you to do that too, because it makes everything easier and more fun. And if business isn't fun, man, it's hard to spend like, you know, at this point, you're spending a couple thousand hours a year working. If all you did was work eight hours a day, right? And I know a lot of business owners work more than that. I mean, that's like 2000 hours a year. Why would you do something for 2,000 hours a year that just was like fingernails on a chalkboard to you. Do things that you enjoy. All right. Lesson number eight, you can have more time. When people say, man, I just wish there was another day in the week. You can have an eight-day week if you want, because let's do the math. There are 1,440 minutes in a day. So you could easily go through your week and delegate 1,440 minutes worth of stuff. So if we truly think that, hey, I would do better with more time that I could invest in other things, there are plenty of other capable, competent humans out there who are willing to work and can do great jobs. And I know in my case, when I've hired a lot of people, So many of them are infinitely better than me at a lot of the things that I've hired them to do. So pull things off your plate, empower other people to go execute, to make decisions, to do great work on your behalf, 
And then you're going to find yourself with that extra 1,440 minutes. There's your eight-day week. All right. Jamie, that's like the halfway point. Do we have any questions at this point? Only from, from me. Yes. I've got a yes. question. If if we're here and you're the question person, because um, apparently Facebook does not like these videos at the moment, then do you have any questions? I do. You said something. Well, you said a lot of amazing gold bombs, as always. Um, but one of the things that you mentioned was those five things that you found that you are really, really good at. Mm-hmm. How did you discover your five? Um, I don't know that it was discovery as much as trial and error and practice. Mm-hmm. It's not like I just found out, hey, I'm good at this the first time. In fact, I believe that with most things, you have to be willing to be bad at it before you've earned the right to be good at it. But what I found were there were things that I was curious about that I enjoyed getting better at. I enjoyed learning about. And then there were things that maybe I didn't enjoy the process of getting better as much. Like I hated writing, hated it. Really? Of of all the things, that was the one that I was most uncomfortable with. Um, I am 100% sure if you would go back to any of my English teachers Um, in my youth, they would be floored by the fact that I've written anything that's even remotely coherent. Um, when I was turning in my senior paper for my undergrad, by the time I got to grad school, I got a little more comfortable and then that kind of got pulled away. But undergrad, I was just lost in writing something with, you know, all the citations and everything else. And I literally had my seventh grade English teacher help me through the entire process. And, um, and and then I submitted, a, you know, early in my coaching year years, I submitted an article to uh, a, a journal that they used to do for the coaches association. Article got rejected, submitted again, got rejected, submitted again, got rejected. Um, and I'm like, man, this is awful because the stuff that was in there wasn't exactly rocket science. And so, yeah, I I absolutely detested writing. But the more I wrote, the more comfortable I got with a certain style of writing. And I can do a few different things Um, writing wise. I'm certainly not going to be the next great novelist and I'm probably not going to be great at textbook ish writing, but readable articles, uh, informal kind of social media or email type stuff. I do pretty well. And um, so, but, but that was trial and error. That was figuring it out. Um, And so I think that's been the case with a lot of stuff. I think that finding my voice in leadership instead of modeling other people um, helped quite a bit. And, you know, since then pretty much, you know, we've had we've won awards for culture and environment, whether it be franchisees or employees and a number of businesses I've owned since then. And I assure you, the first couple of years I was in a leadership position, we would have uh, not made any of those lists. And if they had a list for worst employer or, or in that point, worst leader, I would have probably been a candidate. Um, but you just. Figure, figure out the stuff you're excited about. So I'm hearing a common thread of curiosity and that you just kind of kept pursuing it. The, the writing piece is interesting, though, because you said you didn't enjoy it. But what kept you curious enough to keep pursuing it? Because I, I love your writing and I know much of your audience is the same. So I, I think it was finding somebody that wrote in a way that was intriguing to me. Um, and that kind of being a way to think about it differently. Like most of the, I I've always been an avid reader and most of the stuff I would read would be these long form chapter books. Right. And I found a gentleman named Roy H. Williams, a gentleman I've never met yet have like a, a mutual friend with, and I've seen speak and stuff, but he wrote a series of books. The first of which was called the wizard of ads. 
And, you know, you hear, hey, what books changed your life? Uh, that book easily changed the trajectory of my life many times over. Um, and it, it was written, now he's a much better writer than I am, but it was written in these small kind of memo-ish essay type forms, which have kind of become my default at this point. And I was like, you know, there's a different way to articulate yourself that isn't this formal kind of stuffy writing. And it just kind of opened my eyes to a different perspective. Love that. And it totally goes back to what you said in the beginning, deviating from the norm, but being able to see those deviations and realize you can create your version of that. So thank you for sharing. I'll make sure to include the link to that book as well, if anyone wants to check it out. Yeah, it, uh, it life changing stuff for sure. And I, and it was, it was encouraging because a lot of people in the mainstream kind of online world that I've lived in for a while, uh, about five years ago, they started to find out about Roy Williams. And I'm like, man, I found out about Roy Williams in like 1998. <laughs> um, so they were a little bit later to the party, but it was good to see that his reach wasn't, like it had always been very strong in marketing and advertising, but maybe not in the online stuff as much. And um, so it was cool that he got even more acclaim because yes, he's a, uh, he's a legend. And then some. all right. Um, lesson nine community and accountability drive achievement. So I think we've all heard the, what the Jim Rohn kind of you're the average of the five people you surround yourself with or something like that. Right. I don't know that, you know, I mean, things like that, they're cool sound bites, like why five, not four, why five, not seven, whatever. Um, but I will say that nothing expands your belief of what's possible than being around other people who do bigger things than you. Um, it, it raises your expectations. I've seen it time and time again in sports. People go join a team where the, the expectations and the standards are higher and that person raises the bar. People that, um, go spend time with people who have different habits than theirs often adopt those habits. Um, so, so I think that, um, who you surround yourself with matters so, so much, right? Um, but then also accountability, driving achievement. We've even woven accountability into all of our coaching programs at this point more heavily because we believe in this so much. Um, you know, I think we all do better when we know somebody's paying attention. I mean, accountability doesn't have to always be this Hey, I'm going to track every little detail. You know, I'm not going to track my macros or whatever else. Accountability can be, hey, I've got a training partner that's supposed to meet me at the gym. And so I know I need to show up. I know people are paying attention, right? But if we, even as a business owner, are accountable to, you know, we're accountable to clients. In my case, I've always felt this strong sense of accountability to my family. Um, if you are tracking things, you can be <clears throat> accountable to the standards that you set. That was one of the things that I would do a lot of times would be to gamify things in my business. And so I would create these very rudimentary little games like, hey, I've got to sell one thing every day and I'm not leaving the gym till I do. Well, that's self-accountability where it's a standard and I'm just going to hold myself to that because maybe I don't have a boss breathing down my neck, but I've determined as the owner, this is what it takes. So this is what it takes. And if you're not surrounding yourself with people who are lifting you up, and if you're not setting standards of, of what to expect for yourself or of yourself and putting yourself in an environment where you're either, either accountable to those standards or accountable to other people, you're probably underperforming. And, you know, that for me, I've kind of intuitively known, like if I surround myself with 
the right people, it just raises the bar. Um, and, and it's been that way even since childhood. You know, if I'd surround myself with people who were hard workers in sports or something, I worked harder. So um, be very cautious about who you let in your circle. Um, but then even beyond that, be very cautious about who you take on as clients. You know, and yeah, there's a certain point where you just got to pay the bills. But beyond that, be cautious about who you let into your your environment and how they may affect culture. Because, you know, we want to kind of choreograph that experience for people and create a culture that we like being a part of, that they like being a part of. So that's lesson number nine. Lesson number 10 is a business owner to to an extent. And obviously, there are very basic things, standards we have to meet, you know, food and shelter and things like that. But beyond that, you decide how you're going to measure success. And it took a while for me to kind of figure this out. Um Because again, I would use kind of common vanity metrics that didn't exactly correlate with what I wanted from my business or my life. And I think that as a business owner, this is one of those luxuries that we have is we get to be the decider of a lot of things. So you should probably decide how you're going to measure success. For me, um, I will tell you the, the four things that I focus on And none of them are exactly money focused. Like it's not a big deal to me if I make, you know, 5% more or 5% less money. There's, but money's involved in most of them. So as a business owner, I don't want to act like money's not the thing, but I don't think my quality of life changes if the, the number that I associate with my personal income is this nice round number of X number of hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever, or if it's, you know, a hundred dollars short of that or $200 short of that, I'm not going to be sad if I don't hit some benchmark like that. It's more like for me, the things that that I would measure would be um, creating a legacy for those I care about. So you know, helping not only, you know, my family, um, you know, kind of set the set the tone maybe for my my boys about what they see as possible. Like, hey, you don't have to always play by certain very specific traditional rules when building a career and personal and professional success aren't mutually exclusive things. And then helping, you know, when I think about people I care about, helping clients kind of do the same thing, right? Like they can build the business they want. They don't have to necessarily build the business other people have and just clone that. Um, And money certainly provides the security for some of that long-term legacy. You know, not having to worry about, oh, can we afford college tuition at whatever schools and that sort of thing. It it matters. Um, And then experiences with those people I care about, my family, close friends, that sort of stuff. And obviously, money creates some of those opportunities. Um, It's, you know, depending on what kind of experiences you want to have, it certainly isn't, you know, dictatorial as to having opportunities to, to have experiences. But I think at a certain point, you learn that experiences are more important than things. And... Um, so being able to have those shared experiences is how I measure success. Um, enjoyment of the journey or the process, because I think there have been multiple occasions in my professional life where the destination was very unfulfilling. Um, I remember when my, I think the first time I figured that out was when my, college baseball team we got to the world series and on the flight home i was already worried about well how are we going to get back not basking in the glow of oh we got here and nobody ever thought we would be able to get here 
Um, I remember when we were recognized, I had always kind of wanted to be in the Entrepreneur Franchise 500. The first time we were recognized, both franchises I co-founded were not only in the top 500, they were, one was 193 and the other one was like 279 or something. So they're both in the top 300. And it was exciting for roughly 45 seconds. I mean, I opened up the magazine. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And it was it. So enjoyment of the journey and the process, man, that matters a lot. And from a money standpoint, part of it is not having money stress, not being concerned with, oh, can we pay the bills? Can we make payroll? Are we going to overdraft on this? Can we afford to do that? Not being concerned with that sort of stuff. Um Again, that that's where the money comes in. So when I think about measuring success, I see money as a tool to get these other outcomes. So as long as I can have those, then I got enough money. And then relationships with the people I enjoy. I um, am somebody who values relationships a great deal. Um, you know, I think that is something that it, I'm not always sure about whether social media is a negative or a positive, but I would say that in my case, the most positive part of it is the ease it allows you to stay connected with people that you may not have easily been able to stay connected with, whether it's a grandparent being able to see pictures of a grandkid really easily, or in my case, it was you know my birthday yesterday, people easily being able to reach out um and wish me a happy birthday and then me being able to hopefully do the same during their birthdays or whatever um you know i think that you know i moved and have moved a couple times and don't live close to a lot of the people i've built relationships with along the years and so that makes that stuff easier but for me that's one of those ways i would measure success all right lesson 11 um, and I talk about this a lot with clients. I talk about this a lot with really anybody who's willing to listen. Um, adaptability is a requirement, not optional, 100% a requirement for success. If you want to have sustained success, yes, build around things that won't change. In my, in my world, that means the human beings that I serve. They are largely going to have the same core desires, problems, whatever else for an extended period of time. Now, how those things kind of manifest themselves, they can evolve over time. Um, but building around things that won't change, that's the epicenter, but then adapt everything else. Adapt the adapt to circumstances, adapt to technology, adapt to new tactics, adapt to new patterns and friends and whatever else, right? Um, be willing to adapt with more information or greater wisdom accrued over time. So, you know, I, I see this as people are people. And in general, people evolve more slowly than all the other stuff around us. Um, you know, I think people you know, want to be, want to feel, be, be heard. They want to feel important. They want to feel good about themselves. That's not new. Like you can go see plenty of stuff that was written about human beings 100, 150 years ago. And the, <clears throat> that was still the case. Um, but things that we may do to try to attain that or those things that may change. But so be willing to adapt. The market changes, buying patterns change, all these things kind of evolve. And remember, I, I mean, I was running a business before iPhones and Facebook. So heck, my uh, undergrad in college, like, man, you actually had to like go to libraries. You didn't, the internet was not your research tool. Um, so be willing to adapt. And if you do that and don't get stuck being the last mover, you're going to be so, so much better off. But, you know, as I mentioned, the, the people side of this lesson 12, relationships matter most. 
most important thing, period, and relationships are not granted or gifted or given. They are earned and must be nurtured. Um, most of my business is with people who've known me for more than a year and virtually anybody who's known me less than a year when we start doing business came through a referral or through some other really expedited fashion. Like maybe they heard me speak at an event and then I ended up having a 30 minute conversation with them after I talked or something. But almost everybody else has been like on my email list or something for a year plus. Um, and I think that for me, that's better. I like the relationship stuff. I don't necessarily care about being somebody's first business coach. I kind of want to be their last business coach. Right. Um, and I think you have to honor the other person, honor their time. And, and maybe that, that doesn't sound like a normal word when we're just talking about relationships and the word honor or whatever else. It's just, everybody's time is valuable and it's finite and it's non-renewable. And you, if you're going to use their time, you need to treat it with great respect. And if you do that and actually care about the other person that you're involved in, it shows. And frankly, it's, I mean, it sounds silly, but it's a little bit of a business advantage because other people don't do that. Other people are really eager to talk about their stuff and to just not necessarily listen, but to wait to talk. And they want you to adapt to them. So the more you are relationship centric, the better everything else gets. And then also understand this. It's probably as true as anything could be. It is your responsibility for the continued like the continuation of every relationship. Take personal responsibility. We all get busy. We all have other things on our plate. It is your responsibility. And sure, the other party bears some responsibility too, but until you've held up your part, then you should probably keep your mouth shut and when it comes to their part, right? Like do your job. Like if you care about somebody, make sure that you facilitate that ongoing communication, that connection. Do that and you're going to be so, so much better off. All right. Let's see. Um, oh, last thing about that. Um, everything that we do is about people. Absolutely everything. So when everybody falls in love with, oh, we got these systems or these processes, well, the only reason you need them is to either help people succeed or to help the people you're serving, right? Otherwise, the, the process is irrelevant. So people, 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 right? All right, lesson 13. Every player is their own entity. Treat every person like they're almost like their little own mini business. What can you do to develop them? How can you help them win? Understand that businesses, i.e. people in this case, are multifaceted. They don't operate in a vacuum. They're not just this tactical transactional thing that when they're working for you, that's the only thing going on in their life. So how can you help them be successful? How can you help them be happier? How can you help them have the life they want? And hopefully working with you as part of it. But if not, you still get to do good. And that's okay. Sometimes people graduate from us, right? Um, I have had the good fortune to learn that lesson early on because, you know, when you're a college baseball coach, you get people for a set number of years and when they graduate, they leave. So my job is to treat everybody. They're their own entity. It's not that they're indifferent about everybody else around them, but they, they got their own stuff. And in that case, you know, I dealt with student athletes who were trying to get a degree and navigate their social life and succeed on the field. And they had families at home and, you know, they had worries and concerns and everything else. It's like, man, that person is their own entity and I have to treat them accordingly. Right. It's not just they need to conform to me and they need to fit in to their role here. Same thing with with 
people on my team now. Like they're, they have full lives and, you know, you've got people who everywhere across the board. I mean, you got one guy that has seven kids and somebody else who has no kids. You've got people who, um, you know, are, have young families, people who have more mature families. You got all sorts of different stuff that happens personally for these folks, not just their business. And then, you know, during the pandemic, we had people who the, you know, if they owned a gym, some, some were in a restrict like area with more restrictions, some were in an area with less. Everybody is their own entity. Treat them that way. Um, I, I am kind of nitpicky about the word coach since that's been part of my identity for my entire adult life. Coach is not instructor. Instructor is here's the here are the instructions. I'm going to show you to do said thing. And that's what most people do in the business landscape. They have their approach and then they just instruct that approach. A coach is somebody who's almost like a guide, right? Like they think about a coach. It, I mean, it's just the word was something that transported somebody from where they were to where they wanted to be. Think about the old, you know, stage coach, right? Like a coach, something that moves somebody from where they are to where they want to be. And that's our job as a coach. And that's somebody individually each of them are at a different place and each of them want to be in a different place. And our job is to help them go and move through that journey in whatever role we have to play. So understand that the people that, that are on our team, that are our, our clients, whoever they are, they're, they're running their own race and we need to behave accordingly. Um, along those lines, every person in every business goes through what I call seasons. That's a phrase my wife says a lot, you know, what season people are in. Now, obviously, um, as somebody who has a, a, a kid in college and a kid in middle school, some of our seasonality is school year, right? And then because I coach my younger son's baseball team, just like I coach my older son's baseball team. Um, there was baseball season. And so there are different things that happen, right? Every business has peak hours. I mean, a, a restaurant's probably less busy at three in the afternoon than it is at lunch or dinner. Every retail business, they've got peak seasons. Our priorities as people, they shift, right? Our interests shift. And so we have to be adaptable to both our own seasonality and to the seasonality of the business that we're in. So instead of trying to fight for, oh, how am I going to fill up two in the afternoon in the gym? It's like, well, how do I fill up peak hours and then still use that two in the afternoon time to derive some other value? Um, you know, how do I understand what summer should look like in my business and how to make the most of that versus what falls or, you know, January looks like in my business. They don't all like, they're not all supposed to look the same. So understanding the seasonality of stuff, a lot of this, a lot of the things that I talk about are very much, how do I put this? Like dealing with the world as it exists as opposed to the way we wish it would exist. And when we're talking about people and seasonality and treating people as individuals or businesses in the way the consumers actually behave in them, that's, that's what we're talking about here is, um, you know, if, if we can see, base our expectations about how things actually work and then build around that, we're going to be so much better off. And then lesson number 15, you know, I know I've focused the last third of this on people, but really, if all you did was say, I'm going to be more people centric and I'm going to plan my time better, you will win. Because humans and time are pretty much all there is, right? If you um, use your time better and by the 
By better, I mean focusing on the things that you deem as priorities, not necessarily borrowing my priorities or borrowing Jamie's priorities, but whatever you believe are your priorities, if you focus your time there and you generally show an interest in people and where they are and what's important to them and where they want to go, everything else gets so much easier. And I'm not saying that the goal here is just to have an easy life or an easy business, but if you reduce the friction and actually focus on these things that matter, you're going to go a lot further, a lot faster with far fewer roadblocks along the way. So, Jamie, that's all 15. How'd we do? We did excellent. So many, so many gold nuggets here. Um, and real quick, I want to ask you just a couple questions if we have a couple minutes. Is that okay? You do. Yes, and yes. Beautiful. And those of you watching the replay... Feel free to drop your questions in the comments as well. We will definitely be following up on those. Um, I love what you said about, I don't want to be their first business coach. I want to be their last. Flipping that to a personal trainer's perspective or a gym owner's perspective, for those people that you've seen have really, I guess, high retention for lack of a different way to explain it, what have you seen them do differently that's made that their customers really sticky in the industry? Um, it probably may, you, you may not use the exact same words I used during this, but it's a lot of that, right? It's a lot of actually caring about people. It's a lot of touch points between training sessions. It's people who do what they call their frequent sweaters club. Like, so celebrating the, the, the fact that people come in instead of badgering them when they don't, it could be, checking in with people and seeing how they're doing. It can be paying attention to what's going on in people's lives. Like if you knew that your friend's kid was graduating high school this, you know, this week, it's that kind of time of year. So like this week, did you send them a gift? Did you give them a gift card? Did you ask? Did you say, Hey, where's so-and-so going to college or whatever? Being interested in those people. So they don't feel like they're just another face in the crowd Um, coupled with some of those other touch points beyond the training session. I mean, that's it. That You can do more, but until you're doing those things, you don't need to worry about doing more. Love that. Um, And also that that nugget that you said about that two in the afternoon, you can't fill. (laughs) How can you use that hour to add more value? And you just gave us about four different examples right there. Yeah, and... I mean, there there are plenty of ways that you could look at this. Um, I'm guessing the grocery store is probably pretty empty at two in the afternoon. If you've got to manage your own life and you're not having stuff delivered or whatever else, go during times that like beats going to the grocery store at two on a Tuesday beats the heck out of going Saturday morning. Um, but You know, you could be scheduling social media posts, you could be writing, you could be networking, you could be learning a new skill. And yeah, some people, maybe they can get a one-on-one client at two in the afternoon or something like that. But still, for most businesses, you know, just because you're not doing the on-stage stuff, there's plenty of off-stage stuff to be done, right? Right. I don't care if it's cleaning. I don't care if it's administrative work. I don't care if it's team meetings. Use your off-peak hours to do the off-stage work. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Fitness Business School. Before you go, I have a quick announcement. One of the things that we've been doing with our current clients is taking them through this ideal business diagnostic. And really what it is this checklist that allows you to pinpoint exactly what your business needs next so you can keep improving, keep growing, and build a business that you love to own. One that pays you well, well, one that allows you to have the impact you want to have, and one that allows you to have a lifestyle that you truly enjoy. In this diagnostic, we walk through everything and we do an evaluation and can instantly pinpoint what you need to do next to build that business that you want. 
I'm going to extend this opportunity to get on with either me or my team and take you through this evaluation and fix your business's most vital needs fast. So if we take you through this, you're gonna be able to make those vital changes that you need to finally have what I call your ideal business. If you'd be interested in going through this entirely free, risk-free diagnostic with us and learn what you already have in place, what you're doing well, and where your greatest opportunities for rapid improvement are, just shoot me an email with diagnostic in the subject line to pat at patrigsby.com. Again, an email to pat at patrigsby.com with diagnostic in the subject line will get you scheduled and take you through this evaluation to help you build the business you want.